Okay, howdy. howdy. You guys ready? Yeah. So, welcome to Rosho Christi. Um, I think I see some new people, so welcome everybody. And I see some faces that we haven't seen in a while too. So, um, and most importantly, we see some faces who we were missing last week due to the plague. So, congratulations for surviving. Um, so. For those of you who don't know, this semester, did we start? Yeah, this semester we are talking, at least the first part of this semester, uh, we're going to talk about um, deconversion and deconstruction and basically how to go about thinking through doubts that you have with your faith. So obviously, Rosio Christi, our organization is devoted to Christian apologetics. So being able to answer important questions about what you believe is what we're all about. So these first two weeks, last week and this week, we're doing something that's a little bit different from what we normally do. So last week we heard from Zach talk about kind of his personal story of uh, deconstruction. Again, not what we normally do. This week I'm going to talk about um, some of my personal stories as well as uh, some rambling musings uh, for a little bit. Um, and then next week we have the Veritas Forum, which is there. The, the Veritas Forum, where we will bring in um, Dr. Karen Swallow Pryor to talk about this, uh, this topic. So that'll be uh, a week from today. You should all come. It will be in lieu of any meeting here. Uh, in order to reserve your seat um, in the Rudder Auditorium, go to texag slash veritas22. Uh, it should be a really, uh, really cool event. So um, after that week, we're gonna start talking about some specific topics that might be of relevance um, uh, to you if you have questions about your faith. Um, but like I said, these first couple weeks, we're gonna keep it a little bit more narratival. So, um, because I'm a little bit lazy, I stole some slides from Zach. So if you guys remember from Zach's presentation last week, he gave us some definitions of what deconstruction is. So um, if you guys have heard this term before, people use it in different ways. One is in a negative way to mean destructing or destroying a, a religious belief or a Christian faith. Um, so you are probably all familiar with some of the famous examples recently of people who have deconverted from Christianity, um, people like Sam Harris or the guy from Hawk Nelson or uh, Hillsong Guy or uh, there's a whole list of other people, right? Uh, Rhett and Link on the internet. Um, people who are publicly, uh, you know, denying Christian faith. So that's one, one way that you can use this term deconstruction. You can also use this um, in a more neutral way, which is more what we're doing, which just means critically examining the things that you believe with the goal towards discarding the things that are incorrect um, and reconstructing the, the good parts of what you believe and um, making your beliefs more accurate. And then another term that we might use to help us think through this process is disentangling. And that is identifying the difference between, in this case, Christianity and a whole lot of other beliefs that people associate with Christianity but have nothing to do with Christianity in and of themselves. Um, uh, so we're going to do a little bit of this, too, um, throughout the semester. So... Last week, Zach was afraid to show his fancy picture. Here's my fancy picture. Um, Zach talked about specifically his background in the, uh, the oneness Pentecostal movement. Um, my story today is not going to be nearly so exciting. And, uh, but hopefully it will touch on some topics that some of you guys are interested in. Specifically, we're going to talk about uh, creation and the age of the earth and things like that. That'll be kind of the backdrop of the story that we're going to go through here in a minute. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a rambling description of my life, 
with some rambling commentary on it uh, with the intent of uh, trying to communicate some thoughts that I have had in my life that I have found helpful. So I am not a native Texan. Uh, by the way, I should say my name. My name is Andrew Robbins. Um, I have been here at Texas A&M for a long time. Um, I deleted all the dates from my slides because it was too embarrassing. So uh, they're not on there anymore. Um, but suffice it to say, I have been here for a long time. But I, I'm not from Texas. I was born in Ames, Iowa. Um, I come from a Christian family. And, uh, you know, so I kind of a, a, a typical Protestant, Midwestern American kind of background. Uh, when I was five, uh, my family moved to Wichita, Kansas. And um, one of the things that I'm going to talk to you guys about as I go through different stages of my life is some of the different faith communities that I, I was part of at different stages of my life. Because for me, uh, there's some important things there. And the earliest years of my life, my family was uh, part of a evangelical free church. So who's heard of this denomination? E-free? A couple of people. It's not nearly as common down here, although there is one in uh, College Station. I actually looked it up. I think it's called Grace, but there's like 90 churches that are named Grace. So um, importantly, it's not Grace like Grace Anderson and Southwood and those. That's, that's not an e-free church. Um, uh, so this was my parents, or at least my, on my dad's side, that was their background faith-wise is the evangelical free community. Um, and this denomination is kind of interesting because they have a very minimalistic statement of faith. And so um, they're kind of mere Christianity Christians in a lot of ways and have become more so even recently. Um, but the consequence of that is that you don't ever really talk that much about things, you know, about controversial theological topics because, again, nobody in the church necessarily agrees on them. Um, so that was kind of my background. And, and be, I think because of this, like my family, well, and you'll see the different churches that I've been to, you know, through to current day, we were never really denominational, Right? I think probably it's true of a lot of you as well. If you come from a Protestant non-denominational background, you might have in your life been a part of four or five different denominations, different places, right? Without ever even thinking about the fact that some of them are part of denominations. So, oh, I forgot to push the little button. See there? This? I lived in Wichita, Kansas. Um, when I was about 10, my family moved to Wichita Falls, Texas, so, whoop, back to, back to the right place, right? Um, and uh, at that age, my family went to a Southern Baptist church. So, very different um, in terms of kind of some of the theological presuppositions and structure of the church. When I was in seventh grade, we moved to Sylvania, Ohio. And there we went to a, uh, a church in a denomination called the General Association of Regular Baptists. These are actually the Baptists that didn't like slavery. The Southern Baptists are the ones that did like slavery. That's why they split. Um, but this is where the story be begins, okay? So in seventh or eighth grade, I started having a thought. Uh, I liked science and math in school, and I was sitting in an earth science class, and I think it would have been eighth grade, but I'm not 100% sure. And I was thinking, you know, we were learning about cosmology and stuff like that. And I was thinking about this, and I th this thought popped into my mind, which now I think is profound, but at the time it wasn't profound. It was, it was well, you'll see. So I thought, okay, how could the universe have ever began? Like, think about it. Like, everything exists, and there's some moment where nothing exists before then. Like, it th th that seems impossible. But then on the other hand, how could the universe have existed forever? Like that also, it seems impossible, right? Um, but the important thing here is that I had this thought and I had this conversation in my mind while the teacher in class was probably trying to teach me something. And um, at no point in that thought process did I ever think that maybe like the Christian faith actually has something to say about the answer to that question. And 
I had been a Christian, I mean, I became a Christian when I was like seven, right? And I had been in church for, you know, 10 years at that point, or however long I could remember. And, um, and in churches that were orthodox and conservative and taught things like creation. And, but I never, that, that never connected. Like sitting in the science class, I never even considered that those things might overlap. So in, in my mind, I had this like wall between, you know, church things, school things, and these were just separate things, and they didn't have anything to do with each other. So when I was, when I went to high school, my family moved back to Texas, to which or to uh, Tyler, Texas, there, East Texas. And um, at this point, my parents put my siblings and I into Christian high school. So quick show of hands. Who went to a, um, like a Christian private school or something? A couple, three, four, five. So for those of you who didn't, um, it's a different place. It's a very, it can be a very different place from a, a public school. And especially as somebody who went to public school my whole life and then went, to, this was a very different place. But there were a lot of great things about being in a Christian high school. Um, for one thing, we were taught how to integrate Christianity with everything we believe, not just, uh, you know, you read the Bible and learn about Bible things, and then that's completely separate, separate from all the other domains of knowledge that you interact with, which was a really good thing. But at the same time, now all of a sudden, there was a potential for conflict, right? Because now you have two different people telling you potentially two different things. And this was especially true at my high school. It wasn't that there was a potential that, for conflict. It, that it, it's more that there was a uh, seeking after conflict. And um, so most of my high school education was focused on identifying conflicts between um, things that you might get in a secular education and things that you're going to get in a Christian education. Um, and this is where I was first taught that there is a a war between um, Christianity and science. So, another question. How many of you guys have been, at some point, taught this? Like, that there's, like there's, there are people out there that, that are trying to deceive you with science. This is pretty, pretty common, and there's, it's a spectrum, right? Um, so specifically, again, the topic of the talk today, um, and ironically, this, this was not in like my Bible class. This was in, in my biology class that we were taught this. Um, so we were taught that um, the historic Orthodox Christianity, so the, the Christianity from Jesus to Peter to Augustine uh, to Thomas Aquinas um, to today, like the whole unbroken um, tradition of Christianity uniformly held that one, the earth is 6,000 years old. Two, animals were created in immutable kinds that couldn't change over time, so evolution is false. Um, most features of the physical world were the result of a flood that covered the entire earth a few thousand years ago. Now, maybe you were taught this too. Maybe you believe this, which is fine. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. But the point here is that I accepted this as true, being taught from my biology book, um, without just without thinking about it. I, I just accepted it because it was in my textbook. Um, so, uh, curious, those of you who went to a Christian secondary school, who was taught these sorts of beliefs as, as a high school student? Anybody? Kind of a little bit, not for the rest of you guys. The world's changed a little bit. Um, but this was typical, right? This, was, um, this is what, what we were taught. Um, oh, there was a question for you. So at this point, I no longer had this view of science and Christianity or science in the Bible. I now had this view. You have the Bible, and that means that most of science is wrong. So these are some of the, the thought processes that I, uh, I was working through in my mind. So obviously, 
the Bible is true in what it teaches. Okay, almost all of us in this room probably believe this, right? Um, the Bible teaches that the earth is 6,000 years old, therefore the earth is 6,000 years old. Uh, or a, a, a slightly different argument, um, Orthodox Christians throughout history will correctly identify the, the main doctrines of the Christian faith. Um, so if a doctrine is not well represented in the historic beliefs of the church, it's probably wrong. Um, so a lot of people will say, well, I won't believe anything if it wasn't taught by a, one of the church fathers. Um, which you can find lots of heresies in the church fathers, so maybe don't use that as your yardstick. Um, but therefore, uh, the uniform testimony of the church is that Genesis teaches that the earth is young. Uh, therefore, you know, that has to be the, the real, the true view. We can't have, Christianity couldn't have lost, or couldn't um, have failed to know this doctrine from scripture for 2,000 years. Okay. So, at this point, I graduated high school and I came here to Texas A&M to this very building before it was remodeled. So that dates me a little bit. But I joined this group, Rush Year Christie. So I went to um, Impact Camp. Who went to Impact as a freshman, right? Almost all of you guys. All the cool ones, right? Um, and at the ministry fair at Impact, uh, there was this random guy with a grungy little tablecloth on a table and just like piles of books but he had a sign that said apologetics on it and again one of the wonderful things about going to a christian high school is that we were taught apologetics we taught we were taught first of all what that word means so that when i see it on a sign i'll go and talk to the person who's standing there um but we you know we were taught how to think about our faith and how to question um and that was something that i enjoyed doing so i joined ratio christi Rosho Christie was a wonderful place. We got to do what you we're doing now. A little bit different because I'm talking at you and usually we do more back and forth in discussion. But um, we got to talk about all sorts of interesting and, and you know, things that I wanted to think about, about Christianity. And uh, towards the end of, I don't know if it was the first semester or the first year, but um, we had a meeting, and we always had a couple of atheists in our group, just like we do today. And we were arguing about something related to the age of the earth. And I started providing a defense for why the earth like, was young. Why, well, you know, there's good, re good reasons to disbelieve the consensus, the scientific consensus. Um, and something that was totally unexpected to me happened. The other Ratio Christi members didn't, disagreed with me. I was the only person who held my view. There was only four people in the meeting, so, you know, it doesn't mean much. But the point was, I had other Christians telling me, mm, you, that might not be right. That might not be the right view. And uh, this was very surprising to me. Again, I had just taken this on faith in high school that what my... Uh, biology book, 10th grade biology from Bob Jones University Press, third edition. Um, I just took it that whatever is in the textbook must be true, right? You know, kind of by extension, the textbook is talking about the Bible, the Bible's true, so the textbook is true. Um, so this was like a, this was a significant event for me. All of a sudden, I had to rethink all of that stuff. That I had just, I was just so sure that this was true. But all it took was one Christian to say, you know, give me a couple of reasons why that was wrong. And all of a sudden, that was gone. Now, what I want to do is now take a step back from the actual story and imagine the alternative reality where instead of Jonathan McGregor saying, why do you believe that? That's silly. Um, or that's a bad argument. Um, instead, where I'm talking with a non-believer classmate of, myself, uh, of mine. And I give this argument, you know, the, the Bible is true. The Bible teaches the earth is old, therefore the Bible is old. And then all it takes is somebody who knows the evidence to say, look, radiocarbon dating is pretty good. It's, the, the methods are actually accurate. Here's the chemistry. It's a simple, elegant 
process that you can understand and you can understand why it's not going to be wrong. And it's pretty obvious that the earth, parts of the earth at least, are quite a bit older than 6,000 years old. Um, so the, the conclusion of this could be, well, Christianity is false then. Right? The Bible teaches something. You know, the Bible's the fa- my foundation for my Christian faith. I have evidence now that the Bible is incorrect. So now Christianity is false. Right? Could happen, right? Scream. Now, maybe, maybe actually a, uh, a more accurate picture of what, what would happen here is not saying, okay, therefore Christianity is false, but to say instead, okay, well, obviously the Bible is just wrong, right? You know, maybe some of the history in there is wrong, but we can still, the Bible's still useful for us, right? And then maybe you, um, you come to find that you're reading Joshua, and uh, God basically says, you know, commit them all to the sword, Man, men, women, children, livestock. And now you're thinking, hmm, well, this doesn't really line up with my moral framework. So maybe, maybe the Bible's not really infa- infallible on morality either. It's just a human book that uh, is about God. So now maybe you're thinking, okay, well, but you know, we still have Jesus. Jesus is a cool guy. And then you start reading some Bart Ehrman, and he tells you that, well, you don't really know what's in the New Testament. There's lots of errors, and it's all propaganda. Um, and probably uh, all of the disciples just swooned, or sorry, Jesus swooned, and the disciples found him later, and then, you know, he didn't actually rise from the dead. And now all of a sudden, you're doubting all the, like, core events of Christianity, uh, and this is where you say, okay, now Christianity is false. So this is the death, the death spiral of skepticism, right? And it all started because you're like Zach and you walked into a cave and somebody told you to look at the stalactites, right? So, yeah, in my, in my alternate reality, I then moved to Florida and become a, a transhumanist. So Julie will talk about that later in the semester. Okay, so where does this brittleness come from? This, this situation where something as simple as, you know, again, looking at rocks in a cave causes you to doubt, like, the core truths of the universe. Like, doesn't that seem strange to you? What do you think? I mean, you, probably many of you guys know people who have asked questions like this, right? So, like, what is it, what is it that allows what seems like a small question to really, really break down somebody's faith. I, mean, I think in this case with uh, like this issue, it's kind of because it points to like a lot of uh, Christians kind of view of the world the way it is. So they use like the, age, um, the Genesis story to kind of ground, okay, original sin, and then they use that to ground the need for Jesus' death on the cross. So okay. You have, um, so you might have theological dependencies amongst your views. What else? Any other thoughts? Like why? Why does something again? Age of the Earth seems very distant from the resurrection. True. Yeah. So yeah. If. When you are trusting wholly in what the Bible is, right, and now all of a sudden you, you think that there's something wrong with it, then it kind of does naturally lead to more questions, right? And then I think a lot of people's um, literal and kind of death grip on these types of questions will have a, like, has a pretty bad effect. And so it's maybe not necessarily the age of the earth itself that does it, people's response when the question is brought up by a believer. Yeah, so in, it, it, it a lot of times comes down to the Bible, right? Julie has something to say. So I think it's a problem of equating the truth of the Bible with the truth of an interpretation yeah. of the Bible. So if there's only one 
correct, if we can only come down to one correct interpretation, and there is a correct interpretation, right? But we don't have all, we don't, we don't know everything. But let's say it's a non-essential core doctrine, or non-essential doctrine, so it's not a core doctrine, then there could be different interpretations of like this. But the problem is with the brittleness of thinking there's only one interpretation. Yeah, so I think I think you guys largely have hit on you know a lot of the key points here. One of them is it comes down to a view of the Bible that's not robust, right? Um, everybody wants, at least at face value, to take the Bible seriously, but not everybody does that in a way that actually pu puts uh, a lot of work into understanding what the Bible is, right? And so. Sometimes our default assumption is that I read the Bible and whatever pops into my head, that's what the Bible is teaching, right? Um, failing to recognize all of the things that we've talked about in Russia, Christi, in the past um, that you have to consider when you're in trying to understand something that was not written to you, that was written in a different language, in a different culture, for a different purpose, um, by somebody. Sometimes you don't even know for sure who it was uh, that actually wrote it. And so understanding it's not so easy. It takes a lot of work, uh, especially in the areas of the Bible that we kind of think are weird or um, are, uh, you know, highly debated. It, they're highly debated because it's very hard to understand them. Um, but when you have a view of the Bible that says that we understand everything about it and this is what it means, now all of a sudden you might have beliefs that form from that that are incorrect um, or at least are debatable, but that you are very, very confident in. And then if you find that one of those is false, that psychological confidence can be uh, very challenging to lose, right? Uh, I think another idea is that um, we oftentimes find it difficult to distinguish between core parts of doctrine and you know, peripheral parts, right? So um, here I have a helpful illustration to kind of demonstrate this point. So um, I don't know where these little diagrams uh, originated. My first exposure to these was from something I think that R.C. Sproul wrote. Um, that one is from a book that Greg Boyd wrote, and that was a random thing off of the internet. Um, but the point is, the idea here is that you have a center core, and these are the Im most important things. These are the things that define what it is to be a Christian, broadly speaking. All Christians agree on those things. Outside of that, you have, in this case, they're labeling it dogma, but this is, this is the core teachings of like a denomination, right? So um, we have both Catholics and Protestants in here today. We have different dogma, but in principle, most of the core essences of what it is to be a Christian are going to be the same. So we have in here Presbyterians and Lutherans. Well, I don't know if we have a Lutheran, but... Uh, and uh, do we have any Wesleyans? Anybody? We have a lot of non-denominational people who don't know what they are, right? But different dogma, right? So probably most of you aren't going to agree that Calvin's tulip doctrine is... Uh, like the second most important ring of theology. Most Calvinists deny at least one of the, the letters of Tulip. Ever heard of a four-point Calvinist? Um, and so you might agree, disagree with all those. Again, random internet picture. But the point is, if you think about your beliefs this way, the key is, if you don't know about something that's out here, if you're uncertain, like it practically doesn't even matter. If you're uncertain about something here, it matters, but like it's not, it shouldn't even make you worried about like which church you should be going to. If you're uncertain about something in here, you might want to change denominations. And if you're uncertain about something in here, then that's when you have a real problem, right? Yes, then you come here. Sometimes we argue about these things too, though. But what do you think? What are some of the things that's in, that should be in the center of this? I'm just gonna, I was just going to ask... Whose, whose circle is that? Like, like, Internet. 
I, no, I mean, what, what type of Christian, I guess, is that representative of? Google image search. <laughs> what was the question? What, what, what should go in the center? Name? What's Jesus. in the center? <laughs> it says Jesus. Okay, Jesus. Specifically, the deity of Christ. Okay. Resurrection. Resurrection. That's, that might be a little bit important. What else? Propitiation. Propitiation. That Jesus. You mean on the wrath of God, the paid doctrine of the atonement? Yeah, atonement. Or maybe, probably not even the doctrine of the atonement, but like not a specific doctrine of the atonement, but it's just that, that atonement. Jesus atoned for sins. Yeah. The existence of a God. Yeah, God exists. <laughs> kind of. That's kind of important. That God rewards those who seek Him. Okay. The same like passage that says, you know, yeah, you're, you're God being cares made about and God um, just does not exist, or first somebody must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. So I think that like the goodness of God has to be there. Yeah, the goodness of God. Trinity. Trinity. Yeah. So like doctrine of God. Who is God? What is He? I would say Jesus is coming back, and also kind of going off the God. Second way, coming. Mainly like the creation due to a God. Yeah. yeah so God is. God created the universe. God exists. You know, and, and the what God is, uh, Trinity, um, Christ, doctrine of Christ. You gotta have baptism in the Eucharist at least, otherwise your denomination starts to look really, <laughs> really pretty weird. I mean, I don't know if any, any churches that call themselves Christians that completely. I mean, I think that's arguable. I I would say that that's in dogma. It's just like. You, like it's in everybody's dogma, but like if you, I mean if I don't know. This is more like it's a propositional uh, beliefs, not like practices, right? Is that yeah. Kind of the idea? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you for some reason like denied something about baptism, so but I think that would inform some, even though you can't say a precise proposition, they still inform your beliefs. That like for instance, the the, the denominations that we say are clearly not Christian, Jesuits and Mormons are, I mean. Both of those reject baptism, reject Eucharist. So they, um, I mean, and they reject the Trinity. Yeah, so, like, they, <laughs> yeah so I think they're, probably they're, like, you know, denying the divinity of Christ might be the more important. If the church had to get together a long time ago to write a creed and get the Columbus in the center. So Nicene okay. Creed, we go in there. Chalcedon, Nicaea. 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 Yeah. The, the, first the, the canon might belong in the center. Like, what is in? Yeah, the that's Bible? a good question. So this is worth debating. What do you guys think? Does does the canon of scripture belong in the center? If we disagree about First Enoch, whether it should be in the Bible or not, or maybe uh, maybe more relevant for a conversation going on in the TI Slack, uh, what about uh, the Book of James? Is it an epistle of straw? <laughs> Right? So if we disagree on that, does that throw us out of the camp of Christianity? So is Martin, Martin Luther a non-Christian because he didn't like the book of James? Martin Luther is a non-Christian. Okay, maybe bad example. What do you think? Do you have to accept this, the canon? So I, I would say, it, at least in part on that, because there was a council about this. So like Martin Marcion was officially condemned because he rejected Testament. So I would say that you would have to accept something like uh, the true God is revealed in the scriptures in the Old and New Testament. Like, yeah, it needs to be like pretty broad, like not about who wrote Hebrews or maybe any specific books, but like obviously you can't have. So that, that God has revealed Jesus. Himself through Scripture. Yeah, and, and you need to have a general alignment with the. Canon. But if you yeah, if you deny that. Um, that Hebrews was legitimately added to the canon because they believed that it was written by Paul and they were wrong, therefore it shouldn't be in the New Testament. That doesn't make you a non-Christian, it just makes you weird. So right? one, one thing that I was thinking about this is about like the canon, the New Testament, things like that, is like the earliest Christians didn't even have uh, the canon of That's the New true. Testament, and are we going to say they weren't Christians? Because I mean, it's, yeah, clearly none of these doctrines are um, like necessary in a logical sense, um, right? I mean, so uh, going back to the canon stuff, it kind of makes me think of uh, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. 
uh, mm -hmm. who's traveling along, and he's got a copy of Isaiah. So he's got some of the Old Testament, but because he doesn't understand the meaning of it and the fulfillment of it, he, he has to have that explained to him. So, and that's what allows him to be baptized. Um, so having both components, I think, is clearly a part of it. I'm not sure I follow the reasoning, but I'll take it on your word. you have to have other Christians, too. Hmm? You can't just have scripture. You have to have other Christians, and uh, how, how the church has historically done some stuff. You know, just saying the boundary of the New Testament canon is, might not be essential to being a Christian, because here's an example of a Christian who didn't have a New Testament. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Really oh. But you need some exposure to the content of the New Testament to call yourself a Christian. You call that tradition. Sure. I just want to highlight again, I mean, I think this is why you when, why I think the Baptist and the Christ are so important, because they were they're there for the New Testament. They're there in all Christians around the world, and then even if you have illiterate Christians, they still have these practices. Um, and you know, these among you know, we can argue what practices belong in there, but I, those two especially, I think, are <coughs> ones that... What is Eucharist? Oh, Lord's Supper. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, too much confused. Yeah. So those are... you. They're there before everything else. Yeah. So I think that they belong at a higher... Um, I think sometimes it could be... We can forget that, that they, they've been there for so long. Anyway. You might have outed yourself as a Catholic, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case... You well, I'm sure. not really actually saying anything different than... Um, my Baptist pastor said when I was growing up, so not that he was largely right on that. I mean, he said this very, they, they only had two sacraments. He probably didn't use the word Eucharist, though. So, right, Lord's Supper. But <laughs> these two are what marks people as Christians, and if you don't do that, then you're, you're pretty safely not Christian. So, um, you know, in the words of C.S. Lewis, you know, one of the things that Christians disagree about is actually where things go in this in this little bullseye, right, this, this target. <clears throat> but the point is that there are a lot of questions that aren't really so important. And it's worthwhile to spend time thinking about what are the things in this center group? Because those are the things that you want to make sure that you know what you actually believe. And then you can work your way out as is relevant um, but those are not the distinguishing characteristics. You should never break faith with another Christian because you disagree about this, right? Now, if, if they tell you that um, Jesus was a created being, then, okay, you know, now it's time to you know, switch from friend mode to evangelism mode. Now, a lot of these questions, some of which are more and some of which are less important, are things that we've discussed here in Ratio Christi before. So I encourage you all to go review, as you can all see from our mess of stuff here. We record these meetings so that you can go back and review them and listen to them again. So take a look at some of the, the past ones we've looked at if you guys have uh, questions in any of these areas. But we're not going to address all those today. Um, but I am going to get back to my original story, which was my own personal life, which is almost at an end. I'm not dying. I mean, I, almost at the end, present day. Um, so in reality, remember, when I was telling this story, the person who challenged me on this wasn't somebody who was um, antagonistic towards me. It was somebody who agreed with me on most of the important things in life and who just thought that I had a silly view about um, how to interpret Genesis, you know, a very inflexible view that didn't encompass, uh, at least in his view, what the, the author meant. Now, the point here is not to make an argument for you guys why you should agree or disagree with me on this issue, but rather that um, because I was exposed to the fact that there was diversity within Christianity, in this case, within, like, Protestant, evangelical, like independent uh, Bible church, uh, conservative evangelical Christianity. Um, because I was exposed to this di diversity, it gave me the opportunity to interact with these questions without thinking that I was denying the truth of Scripture. 
Uh, and this was really useful. But it also made me think, OK, well, I guess I need to actually think about all the things that I believe and not just accept all the things that they taught me about the Bible in biology class. Again, not the best source of Bible knowledge. Believe it or not, your high school biology teacher is not trained in Bible. At least mine wasn't. We just learned from Bob Jones University anyway. So um, basically, there's no shortcut to this, though. I mean, you just you have to do the hard work. You have to actually think about the issues. Um, and this is what I started doing. I read a lot of really great books. I found this book at a, uh, at a yard sale, actually, just right at the opportune time. It's like 50 pages long, and it's like old from the 80s or something. Older than me, which tells you something. Um, but it was a really great book. It tells you all about radiocarbon dating, or not radiocarbon, radiometric dating, all the different types of radiometric dating. Um, and so I very quickly was convinced that, OK, my previous view was wrong. And it didn't destroy my faith. It didn't make me question uh, you know, that scripture was true. It just made me think, OK, I have no idea what the author of Genesis is trying to convey here. And again, if you guys are interested in this topic, you can find um, two or three recent uh, meetings that we've had on Genesis and some of the related topics there, going into great detail on uh, different uh, views and interpretations and, and how to look at reading Genesis. But the point here today is to just think about how to go through this process. How do you question your beliefs um, without going crazy, right? Um, or going into that death spiral. And the first thing is don't question alone. Do it as part of a community. And you have to find the right community. Probably any of you guys who have had questions before have made the mistake of asking the question to the wrong person, right? And they just kind of blow it off, or they look at you and they're like, OK, um, this person's not a Christian anymore. Now I have to go out of friend mode and go into evangelism mode because they have this weird question about the Bible. Or, you know, you got to find people who you can actually seriously question things with um, and think through. And, um, and not just a community of peers, a community of people who are older and wiser than you and, and can help you think through that, which is something that we frequently lack nowadays. Um, especially in the college environment, um, most frequently you're going to be spending time with peers. Even when you're in like a Bible study that's led by a leader, how often is it? It's like a college student who's like one year older than you, right? Right? Who, who in here is a Bible study leader of groups? Yeah, I know a bunch of you guys are, right? How, how, that, I don't know why we do that, but we all do that, right? Instead of finding somebody who's actually like, experience some life, you find the person who's experienced an extra month at A&M. Hmm? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Oh, we also have a lot more college-age people than we have, like, not college-age people in College Station, so there are some logistical challenges. But seek that out. Find people that you can actually talk to about these sorts of things. And Rosho Christie can be a place for this. Um, that's what we're here for. Um, if you know people who have weird questions, send them to us, and we'll talk about them in downstairs until midnight every Thursday. Um, and I'm not joking about that. They didn't last week. Well, okay, we left at 11. We didn't, we didn't test it, but they didn't kick us out at like 10 like they did last time. So make sure that you are also finding good resources. And this is a, this is a really important skill. Because there, is, there are a lot of bad resources out there. Literally any old person can sit down and write a book. And the less qualified a person is who writes a book, the more popular it's going to be in most cases. So be careful. There, you think it's easy to write a book. Think about how easy it is to put something on the internet. So just because you can find something on the internet and it's in the first five results on Google doesn't mean it's a good resource. Um, and that could lead you in either direction. You'll find something that's, you know, going to uh, you know, attack your beliefs um, without, you know, having really good ground for it. But you're also going to find someone who's trying to support the Christian faith in a way that is um, 
false, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And, and that's not going to do you any good to, to find that sort of stuff. So th this is really hard, but learning how to really critically assess uh, resources that you're, you're delving into. And again, doing that in a community is a very important skill. And uh, like we've already said, separate the essentials from the non-essentials. If you're worried about a doctrine that is not in those inner rings, I'm pointing as if that's still up there, um, that's okay. Just think about it. That does not, that is, that is like not necessarily mean that you are sliding out of Christianity, right? It just means you have a question. And it may actually be that you have an incorrect doctrine. And again, it's in the outer rings and it doesn't matter. You can switch to, a, you know, a different doctrine and you're still a Christian. Like, this is okay. Um, and importantly, explore Christian diversity. Start to learn about what actual other Christians actually think about things. A lot of times, at least in my life, again, I had a very specific kind of history. Um, and the intellectual development of me as a Christian really was in high school. And I was literally taught to believe that the things that I was being taught you know, very specific doctrines, um, like a very specific type of young earth creationism, a very specific type of um, uh, eschatology. And I was taught that these were the uniform teaching of the Christian church throughout history. When in fact, both of those particular doctrines are like less than 100 years old, 150 years old. And if you leave the United States, like the number of people who believe those, in the, at least in the, those specific formats, like goes down dramatically when you're out of the English-speaking world. Hmm? Oh, I was just saying sp the specific versions of like younger creationism that I was taught, um, very much like um, Institute for Creation Research, Ken Ham type stuff. It's very niche from when you think of in terms of a global perspective. And, and, historical. and historical perspective, it's very niche. But it's also the thing that gets talked about pretty much the most. Sure. The, the Bill Nye Ken Ham debate was such a huge cultural event. It was all people. <laughs> You're too old. That's because yeah. it's Bill Nye. Well, Everybody so. loves Bill Nye. Sure. But nobody when you, loves when you hear about it, it, it feels like this stuff is easy to put forward, even if it's not in the center. In fact, it feels like the things that are way outside the center are the easiest to put forward. Yes. In, in well, I mean, okay, media. let's be honest. We all thrive on uh, debate and uh, disagreement, right? Like that is, that is the currency of our culture, right? If you have two people that like almost agree but don't quite agree, nobody cares about that. Everybody cares about when you have people that agree so much that they hate each other. Sorry, I disagree so much that they hate each other. Um, everything is, is more and more polarized. Uh, Andrew, one weird thing is, I think, about talking about the central core doctrine, is that, like in, in your case, um, your particular ver you know, Christians that taught you, they obviously had just become convinced of that view. And they, they then when they're settled in their conviction, no matter, no matter if they did diligence, but then they move it to the center. So even, it, so in, even if I agree in mere Christianity, and I know that the non-essentials are in circles around, but there's a tendency, and even if, if, if I do lots of diligence and settle on something, like, like you know, I settle on a non-essential thing and I think my view is pretty, you know, I'm, I'm pretty convinced. 90% sure that you're right. Yeah, I'm 90% sure it's right. It, it's weird because in my mind, I think then I put that in the, I mm -hmm. think it slips over into the core. Yeah. And it's hard to keep it, it's hard to keep something that you're settled in conviction on, on a non-essential from slipping into what you would say has to be the core now. Yeah, remember that this target here is independent of your certainty, right? The things that are in the core are there whether you're certain of them or not, and the things that are in the periphery are there whether you're certain of them or not. So just because you become convinced that Calvinism is true and that Arminianism is false, 
That does not mean that Calvinism is now a core doctrine of Christianity. But, who, any Calvinists in here? Anybody willing to admit? Okay, a couple. You'll, you won't meet very many Calvinists that won't believe that Calvinism's in the center, right? <laughs> My experience. But even if you might, do, you might not even know you're doing it. You, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like you're not, mm-hmm. you're not purposely going, oh, now, okay, now, now I'm going to put that in the center. No, it just happens that once you become, did, did that make sense? You, yeah. you all of a sudden assume then that it should be. Yeah. You, you, you equate the global certainty of a doctrine with the, uh, your personal certainty, right? What the viewing? Uh, not of the atonement. I think just, you could hold to the same. I, I, there's lots of differences between. So there are, when we say like the atonement. So yeah, you can hold lots of different views of the atonement. Those doctrines of the atonement are, aren't what we're saying is in the center. What we're saying is in the center is that Christ atoned for sins in an important way, right? Like in a meaningful way. If you deny that, you're not a Christian. If you accept that, it doesn't matter exactly what the details of your atonement, um, your, your theory of the atonement are. Those might, you know, those are going to be in the next ring probably, depending on what they are. But maybe I believe in um, penal substitutionary atonement, but somebody else believes in like penal substitutionary atonement, but also Christus Dictor. And if you believe that, that like, that's not difference in the middle. You can go listen to our talk last semester or whenever that was on the atonement, and you can learn those terms. Uh, I was just going to point out that uh, Julie said certainty about things on the outside doesn't move them to the inside. Mm -hmm. But there is a relationship between, I guess, certainty and things in the innermost circle. Presumably, to call yourself a Christian, Certainty is probably the wrong word, but you have to have some kind of assent. Uh, you have to assent to them, but you don't have to have psychological certainty. So you have to believe them. I also feel like that's probably a, a tricky balance. Yeah, this is another important thing. Um, the, some, we tend to equate belief and certainty. You don't have to be certain of something to believe it. You can doubt something and still believe it. Um, in fact, you really should doubt a lot of things because you don't actually know if you believe it, really believe it, until you start doubting it a little bit. Um, so you can doubt the things that are in that middle. Like you can have questions about them, you can explore them, and you should. Um, and that doesn't mean that you're not believing them either. In, you know, in, in fact, I, I think we can. Those of us in here that are Christians, we tend to think that Christianity is true, so we can ask whatever question we want, and God will. God will have the answer, right? So you should feel uh, able to ask those questions um, and explore them. Like that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. This is a more epistemic question, I guess, in nature. Um, but I've seen kind of things like this target for a, a long time, I guess. And what always confuses me or makes uh, them difficult to me is if everybody has a little bit of a different idea of what the target is, and at the end you can't really be certain who's got the actual target. Yeah, that's um, true. At, at what point do you still know you have a target that's good enough you can narrow it down? Because, like, for example, a Mormon, um, they would call themselves Christians. So I grew up in an area where Mormons were really heavy, and so they would come around they would call themselves Christians. And all the rest of the Christians have to go, no, what you mean by Christian, what we mean is very different, because we would have these things in our target, and you would have those things. And mm-hmm period, um, you know, the two don't mix. So at yeah. some point, you have to be able to narrow the target down enough to go beyond your opinion, but at a broad scope. And I just don't know if I see how you easily do that. Well, just I think what, what Zach said is right. Um, we have creeds, right? So, I mean, if you can't say the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, then, like, like those are basically what you should think of as the core. Fundamentally, um, all of Orthodox Christianity, okay, I know that's begging the question to label one as Orthodox, but um, we all agree to those creeds, right? And once you start denying those creeds, pretty much everyone is going to agree that you're now in a different camp. Now, you are still free to do that. You are still free to become a Mormon, but yes, there is, at that point, you have denied core doctrines, and now you are something different. You're Christian 2.0. 
be all people everywhere? Would all people everywhere accept? Yeah, I, so uh, I mean, that just might, that still seems hard to actually really have. Well, I mean, I mean, we have the, we have the creeds, right? Yeah. I guess it's just I don't know. You go um, what? Well, what's in the center is what all Christians everywhere accept. Almost seems like you've worked yourself back into okay. Well, who's a Christian now? Well, yeah, so great. that's why I said it's kind of begging the question, right? That, yeah. But. Um, I don't know. I think it's pretty hard to argue that Marcion, uh, for example, like Marcionism is part of like the historic flow of Christianity. I mean, th- but there was a point in Christianity where say like we did. There were points in Christianity where the uh, councils literally had to go back and undo it. But before that, most of the people in Christianity or Christendom believed what was later declared heresy. Yeah, but we're kind of dealing with edge cases here, though. Right? Yeah, but whatever like method you use should be universal if it's a method for finding truth, right? Well, okay, I, to be clear here, there is no like there is no syllogism that we can use to fill this out, right? Um, so yeah, I mean you can choose to fill that with other stuff. Again, it's not like Yeah, that's also true, right? So it's like a probability distribution. <laughs> 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 One thing that I think might help is that, I mean, for, I think everybody here is a Protestant, so, or near, nearly so, um, you probably already implicitly believe this, so it may help you, that just because the vast majority of people who call themselves Christian hold on to a belief, doesn't suddenly make that belief even orthodox. Um, I mean, like, this is this is true. Of the Trinity. Regard, yeah, exactly. So the people who um, haven't thought about the Trinity or studied. Yeah, theory. most people have heretical views of the Trinity. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to bring up a historical example. So in the um, Council of Nicaea, like in, with the Arian um, controversy, I believe that it's, I, I don't want to say this incorrectly, but I've heard before that a large majority of people who were Christians at the time were actually Arians. And so until St. Nicholas came up. And, yeah, so no, well, no, that's no, actually that's a bigger yeah. question. What this is a bigger question when it comes to religious epistemology, too, because, for example, when you talk about Hebrew religion, which I won't go into that because it's my own sense, but, but, for example, when you read the Old Testament, basically every single king, and, in fact, most of the, uh, uh, throughout the books of, uh, of the kings, most of the uh, uh, temple officials are offering pagan sacrifices. And there's a wonderful passage where Elijah, in First Kings 7, I think, says, am I the only orthodox... Uh, Hebrew in the entire land at this point. Am I the only one who's still faithful to Yahweh? And so there's this distinction, I think, that, which is really relevant that I think Katie's getting at, is the distinction between what's the official like, what's the view of the like the, the, the tradents of orthodoxy, which in the Bible, like the biblical authors, would be the prophets, for example. Like, Isaiah has a better idea of what orthodoxy is than random Jew in the field. Uh, yeah. Who's concurrent. Yeah. And likewise, I think what we're getting at here is that when we're talking about what's in the center and how to define those things, we're talking about the sort of, I guess, traits of Christian theology, not necessarily the average person in the pew. Yeah. Who, who not an argument from numbers, like, yeah. oh, this is what most people believe, but more that, oh, yeah, more of like a historical that's flow of ideas. Going, um, with the question necessarily. You might get where we're But, um, well, let's, let's wrap up. I think we're actually, are we over time? Yeah. Well, we started like, yeah. We started like. So um, I just have a, again, to beat the dead horse just a little bit more. Um, the things that I want you guys to kind of get away, take away from this um, is that one, it's okay to be uncertain about a lot of different things and that you don't have to feel some kind of existential dread or um, you know feel like you are having to reject Christianity because you um, are worried about like whether Moses wrote the Torah, right? You don't. That is like such a third tier question, right? Um, and some of these issues are unsettled. Okay, did Moses write the Torah? That is an unsettled question, believe it or not, among like conservative Old Testament scholars. Um, like Julie was saying, once you do decide that you know the answer to a question that doesn't somehow make it settled for everybody, right? 
That doesn't now mean it's in the center and you get to, um, you know, throw people out of the church because they have a differing view or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever you're doing. Um, so be charitable to those who do have uncertainties. You know, just because somebody asks you a weird question about the Bible, that doesn't mean that they are now like, a, you know, a heathen of some kind. Um, they just have a weird question about the Bible that you probably don't know the answer to. And instead of being like, okay, weird, stay away from me, say, oh, I don't know. We should probably actually do a little bit of research. And again, focus on the bullseye. And, right? That, that's what's in the middle. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, in the, I'll leave it on this slide to end. A couple of... Uh, good resources that I have used at different times, but um, that's it for today. Thank you guys for being here. We're going to go downstairs to Revs and hang out for a little while, talk about random stuff, probably ask uh, Zach to speak in tongues for us again. He's going to say no, and then we're going to be sad, and uh, maybe make him show us some, some pictures of uh, snake handling or something. <laughs> I guess he wasn't that kind of Pentecostal, but okay, thank you guys.